Assalamu alaikum, welcome to this live stream. Today we're going to be doing part two of methodological naturalism, the rules no one needs and no one, you no, what, how does it go? No one needs and no one obeys. No one needs and no one in, obeys, absolutely. So Paul, you have a presentation, I'm guessing, right? I do, and uh, let's see here, present, share screen. This one. And that should be my title slide. Brilliant. Wonderful. Okay, okay, let's get started. Over to you. Thank you, Subor, for having me back. This will be part two uh, of our series on methodological naturalism. So uh, I'll be talking about this today in our outline. Uh, first, let's steel man. That's the logical opposite of straw man. So we're going to make the best case we can for methodological naturalism, which will turn out to be the problem of induction, a classical philosophical puzzle, and the god of the gaps. Uh, then I'm going to say that both of these, while they are significant, uh, are really nothing to worry about, or almost nothing to worry about. Then a little history of science, uh, and I will be arguing that the real motivation for methodological naturalism is, to be blunt, intellectual laziness and inertia. And then we'll end with uh, a little thought experiment uh, why methodological naturalism is a rule no one needs and, and no one obeys it anyway. All right, let's steel man methodological naturalism. So here, just to refresh your memory, is the rule. Uh, coming from the U.S. National Academy of Sciences in 1998, but this is a, an expression of a rule found throughout the philosophical and, and scientific literature that the statements of science must invoke only natural things and processes. I like this formulation because it's succinct and has the uh, features of an imperative that you must do this, and also that adjective natural, which, as I said last time, means deriving from physics. So there's the rule we'll be looking at. Now, uh, I want to give you a real-life case uh, to begin to explore what I'm calling the problem of induction with respect to inferring intelligent causes. So as I said, this is a real-life case. This is Robert Clark Ridge, uh, the man there in the middle here with the Hawaiian shirt and uh, the natty pompadour haircut, being arrested by California plainclothes police in uh, Morro Bay, California in 1979. Now, his legal name was Robert Clark Ridge, but he was known to investigators uh, as Mint Jelly Ridge uh, for reasons that uh, you'll understand in just a moment. All right, so imagine that you are the manager of a restaurant, a place, let's say, that serves breakfast all day. Uh, we have several of those type of restaurants very close to my home here in Illinois. And one of your employees comes into your office uh, in the restaurant, and they say there's a man on the restroom floor, on the WC floor, and he's bleeding badly. So you go in there and sure enough, there he is and there's blood and it's terrible. And he says to you, I slipped on some jelly, right? One of these little packets of jelly that you get at breakfast type restaurants. And then he threatens to sue because you have failed to keep your restaurant clean. He's fallen, he's bleeding, serious injury. But then he says, look, why don't you just give me $500 and... I'll go on my way and we'll call it an, an immediate cash settlement. I won't sue you. If that's all you knew, the information on this slide, right, you might give him the money. Because after all, if he were to hire an attorney and sue you, your restaurant chain might be out a lot more than $500. So you make an on-the-spot decision. You say, okay, I'll give you some money. We'll call it even. And, uh, you know, I can avoid litigation for my restaurant. But consider this detail. Now, remember, this is all you know, but this is not all that insurance companies know. 
that insurance investigators and state police know. Consider this detail. I slipped on a container of mint gel. Keep that flavor of jelly in mind. Now, change your job. You're no longer a restaurant manager in uh, my thought experiment here. Although, again, this thought experiment is based on a real-life case. Now you're an insurance investigator, and you see this pattern throughout the Western United States. Restaurant number one, I slipped on mint jelly. Restaurant number two, I slipped on mint jelly. Same guy, right? Robert Clark Ridge is getting cash settlements for accidents in two restaurants. It's the same flavor of jelly. Now, keep in mind, basic probability theory, there's a probability associated with this event. There's a probability associated with this event. If these events are independent, as they appear to be, you would take the product of those two probabilities. So that is going to be much smaller than each of them individually, each of those events individually. When you see this, <laughs> you are not going to give him any more money. In fact, what happened in this case, uh, and you can read about this in the literature of the story, is... Uh, uh, Emergency rooms were notified if someone came in with an injury and claimed that he had fallen on mint jelly in a restaurant to hold him until the police could get there. Okay, mint jelly was not out to kill Robert Clark Ridge. He was faking his accidents. Now, the evidence is clear. He was deliberately staging these events. And it was really a terrible way to make a living because to make his falls, uh, his apparent accidents realistic, he kept open cuts on one arm and that arm was nearly gangrenous when he was finally arrested, right? So handcuffs. This kind of action is known in insurance fraud as a slip and fall artist. Okay. Let's go into the logic of what's going on here. There's a causal impotence claim being made on the part of the investigators. It looks like this. There is no natural, meaning non-intentional cause for the same person to fall repeatedly in different locations, but always on a packet of mint jelly. So we are passing through an analytical node or an analytical filter where physical causes are going to be found insufficient. Physical meaning non-intentional, non-intelligent. There's no mind or agent, okay? Last time I called these bottom-up causes. Now, the logic of what's going on here was described by Bill Dembski in this monograph from Cambridge uh, that I recommend to you. And actually, you may want to wait to get the book, because right now, Bill and a co-author, uh, Winston Ewart, are revising this monograph in the light of 25 years of new developments in probability theory, in design theory, and so forth. So you may want to wait until next year when the second edition, second and greatly expanded edition is going to come out. But in any case, Bill looks at the logic here and he develops what he calls the explanatory filter. Uh, now, this is a conceptual filter that models all kinds of different design inferences, where you start here at the top with some event or pattern that you wish to explain, and you're going to pass through a series of logical nodes, very much like you would have a series of filters that stack on top of each other, and at each node, you have to answer a question. So the first question is, did the event have to happen or was it contingent? Where we make a distinction in, in philosophy of science, but also in physics between contingent events and necessary events. So your first node is, did the event have to happen? Was there or was there some physical necessity that's implicated uh, just the way that if I had a, a a weight in my hand, let's say this uh, this pen, this is an object with mass and a gravitational field. If I let it go, 
uh, it will fall towards the center of that field with a probability one, all right? Here, physical necessity is playing a role. If there's no physical necessity to explain the event, we say, yes, it's a contingent, not a necessary event. We pass to the next node of the filter, which asks, is the event or the pattern com complex? Now, this is a threshold. There's a threshold here where a certain amount of complexity allows you to move uh, to the next node, namely specification. The complexity threshold needs to be set by a, an associated theory. We don't have time today to go into the mathematics of that, but the second node says, is there a sufficient complexity? If the answer is yes, then we move to the node that Dembski calls specification which you could understand at a, at a basic level as pattern matching. Uh, and I'll give, uh, I'll give some examples of that. Uh, well, I did, I think, last time. Uh, so if you, if you are curious about what a specification is, go to the first talk in this series and look at the examples I give, and that will help you understand it. In any case, this portion of the filter is what captures design complex of events of small probability that are specified independently implicate design. Now, complexity itself is insufficient because there are plenty of complex patterns out there in the world that we would say, well, that's just a whole bunch of stuff in a complex pattern, but it's not, uh, there's no reason to think that that was caused by intelligence. So you need to have a string of yeses here as you move through the filter to get to design. So let me just give you some quick examples. Here we have waves arriving at a seashore. When you uh, go into the physics of what's going on here with water, with, with a wind and the, the uh, uh, underlying physical story, you find that you've got necessity operating. There's no reason to think that this is contingent in any sense, all right? This is a necessary event at a seashore. You're going to have wave action. Here we have lots of complexity, this pile of rubble, but it's just a pile of rubble. It's very complex, yes. In fact, that particular, the probability associated with that particular pile of rubble is very small indeed, but there's no reason to think that chance plus physical process won't explain that for you. Here, however, this is Petra in Jordan. We have a complex pattern that's also specified. You've got doors, windows, columns, carving. This is clearly a building. No rational being would say this can be explained by a chance process, right? So complex, it's a complex specified event and design is implicated. Some agent or agents constructed that, that uh, surface there at Petra in Jordan, okay? Now, let's go back a step. Remember, we have decisions to make at each of these nodes. As we're building our inference to design, we can call these logical turnstiles. They exist at every node in the explanatory filter. I apologize for mixing metaphors here of a filter and logical turnstiles. But the reason I use the turnstile metaphor visually is I want you to think of something that you can pass through or not pass through, depending on what you decide about the available evidence. And at each of these nodes, you've got to pass through one of these turnstiles. So let's look at just one of them. The design inference, as you're going towards those, the, the, those bottom nodes of complexity and specification, you must exclude as causally insufficient the possible natural processes for the objects or patterns that you wish to explain. You've got to pass through that turnstile. And again, turnstile here is a visual metaphor for a logical decision, yes or no, with respect to what the explanatory resources are for any event or pattern that you wish to, to uh, explain. You have to rule out the natural causes. That's the inferential requirement here. 
Now, this entails necessarily the possibility of error at each decision node. Why? Because you might pass through the turnstile without warrant. In other words, choosing yes or no may be unjustified in any particular case because your search for natural causes may be incomplete. And I'll give you I'll give you some examples in just a moment. Uh, this is a I guess you could say a somewhat roundabout way of expressing the problem of induction for design inference. Okay. The history of science provides many examples of this problem, namely of prematurely stopping the search for causally sufficient natural processes. Let's look at two. In 1634, four years after his death, uh, Kepler's uh, son, one of his sons, published posthumously Kepler's treatise called Somnium, which was an early work on lunar uh, astronomy. Okay. In the Somnium, Kepler makes an argument that's quite interesting, and it uses a form of Dembski's explanatory filter. Remember, Dembski's explanatory filter is a a rational reconstruction of inferences that all humans make more or less on a daily basis. You do it without even being conscious of it. You go through something like the explanatory filter to arrive at a design inference for something as simple as getting a message on your iPhone, frankly. But here's what Kepler does in, in, in the Somnium. He says, we must exclude the natural causes first. And I'll give you, this is an English translation of the original Latin. When things are in order, so by that you should understand this is our event or pattern that we wish to explain. Something that's that exhibits some features that evoke our curiosity, and we say, What well, you know, that's very puzzling, that's very interesting. We need to explain that thing, as Kepler puts it, a thing that's in order. If the cause of the orderliness cannot be deduced from the motion of the elements or from the composition of matter, it is quite probably a cause possessing a mind. So this portion of the explanatory filter. What's Kepler saying? We have an event or a pattern that we wish to explain. We feed it into the filter and necessity, physical necessity and chance processes don't do it for us. They're causally insufficient. So to go back here, motion of the elements or composition of matter, that's a, a somewhat longer expression of physical necessity. There's no physical process lacking a mind that will account for the pattern in question. So he says, then it's quite probably a cause possessing a mind. So he's moving down here to, to the design portion of the filter and saying the pattern that we wish to explain is, is not handled, not explained by physical process, okay? Then he goes on. If you direct your mind to the towns on the moon, I shall prove to you that I see them. In the spotted parts of the moon, the perfectly round shape of the hollows and their arrangement, or a certain equality of the distances between them are artificial and produced by some architectural mind. For that scooping out into the form of a circle cannot be accomplished by any motion of the elements. Again, note the role of a causal impotence claim here. As he puts it, for that scooping out into the form of a circle cannot be accomplished by any motion of the elements. So he asserts that no physical or undirected cause can produce the effect in question. And he got it wrong. It's a nice uh, body to have orbiting our planet, lights up the night. We can set calendars by it and so forth. NASA is on its way back. They launched a big craft yesterday going back to the moon. They're, after 50 years, they're going to start exploring the moon again. There's nobody up there, right? Certainly no inhabitants. There are no towns. It's... You know, it's a fascinating object, but it's, it is totally sterile. There's nobody there. What went wrong? Well, Kepler was very smart, and he was an excellent astronomer. 
He gave us the laws of planetary motion on, upon which Newton constructed his celestial mechanics. Something went wrong. What went wrong was he didn't do his homework at that first node, that first turnstile. Sufficient natural causes do exist. If I had took you outside here in uh, my uh, little village here outside Chicago, there's a, a, a small lake nearby. And on a still day when the surface is nice and smooth, we can you know toss a rock in and we'll have a beautiful wave pattern uh, emanate from the point of impact. This is not true. All right, there is a sufficient natural cause at this first node. He didn't do his homework. And as a result, he passed through that turnstile, passed through that first node. Again, I apologize for the mixed metaphor. And ended up down here in error, all right, because he didn't do his search at that first, at that first uh, logical node. There are other examples, lots of them, in fact, in the history of science of this particular sort of failure. One occurred in Darwin's day uh, with one of his best known contemporaries, Louis Agassiz, in his essay on classification and his hypothesis about the origin of cavefish. So this was published in 1857, two years before the origin. There is Agassiz showing uh, some uh, invertebrate phyla. Uh, drawing in chalk. Here is a cavefish that has been very well studied, a Mexican cavefish. Uh, remarkable species uh, that uh, actually has a rather substantial body of work associated with its genetics development, population structure, and so forth. Really uh, just a, a wonderful chapter of biology that I wish I knew more about. I know a little bit about it, but I wish I knew more. Anyway, you'll notice there's no functioning eye here. The remnants of an eye, but not a functioning eye that can detect light. So what does Agassiz say about the origin of these blind cavefish in the essay on classification? He says, they were created with all their peculiarities by the fiat of the Almighty. Why? Well, he left them the rudiment of an eye as a remembrance, Agassiz argues, of the great general plan of structure, the great type to which they belong. In other words, God as designer is reminding them that they belong to this group of fishes that have eyes. They get just a little bit of an eye. It doesn't actually work as a reminder of their of the group to which they belong. But they were created directly as we see them. Okay, Agassiz was a, you could say, a design theorist of the mid-19th century and probably one of the greatest. Uh, you know, he did he did tr a tremendous amount of, of valuable scientific work on glaciers, on uh, how to classify organisms and so forth. Uh, the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard is named after him, or at least it was. I don't know if they've changed the name. Unfortunately, he, he had some other properties or qualities of his time, such as racism, that we won't go into. But he was a great scientist by any measure of that word. Um, but he got it wrong. Okay. Let's fast forward about 100 and... 25 years into the 20th century, two intelligent design biologists looking at the very same cavefish say, yeah, it's explained by evolutionary processes. So Wayne Freyer and Percival, da Percival Davis, looking at the very same data as Agassiz, say blind cavefish with remnants of eyes appear to have true vestigial organs. These and similar degenerations have indeed resulted from typically disadvantageous mutations. Now, that was 1983. Uh, 40 years later, the story about the origin of the cavefish phenotype, the blind cavefish phenotype, is much more complicated and interesting. And arguably, the genetic changes that happened in the history of these fish 
should not really be seen as disadvantageous mutations. It's a much more interesting story today. I don't have time to go into it, but I encourage you to look at the recent literature on cavefish evolution to see the fascinating details. One could make a strong case that it is, in fact, advantageous for cavefish not to have eyes for all kinds of reasons, and that there is a genetic system that disables uh, eye development, because in that pitch black environment, eyes are actually a detriment. In any case, my point here with this slide is intelligent design advocates writing about 130 years after Agassiz have no problem with a natural explanation for its lack of eyes via evolutionary processes. What went wrong? What went wrong, again, is failure at that first turnstile. Sufficient natural processes do exist. And we say to this hypothesis, such as it is, no. Okay. We're seeing a pattern. We're seeing a pattern here. And the pattern is don't pass through this node too quickly or these first two nodes of natural process too quickly, do your homework at both of them because there may be natural processes that are adequate, in fact, more than adequate, causally sufficient for what it is that you wish to explain. All right, we come now to the philosophical, uh, the, the general form of the philosophical problem, which is known as the problem of induction. And that's the genus and the species within that genus is the god of the gaps. Here's a statement. There's no natural cause for phenomenon X, let's say made by Kepler, made by Agassiz, made by anyone. And the expanding wavefront of scientific knowledge sweeps over that claim. The natural cause is found and there's a Nobel Prize waiting for the scientists who found it. And that hurts. And that's a position you don't want to be in. You don't want to be saying there's no natural cause for X when the natural cause is waiting to be discovered. So Elliot Sober puts it this way, the past successes of scientific explanation suggest that what is now inexplicable may eventually be brought within the scope of scientific understanding. So think, of, think about this on the model of an expanding wavefront. I showed you that picture a few moments ago of a circular wave pattern emanating from the point of impact in a surface of water. That wave front is going to move out with time as it does in this, applying this metaphor to scientific knowledge. As the expanding wave front of scientific knowledge goes out, it will pass over claims like X cannot occur naturally and bring them within the framework of scientific understanding. And you'll get it wrong, right? So this is the point that Sober is making here. All right. This is worrisome. Because of the problem of induction, we might make a mistake when we infer when we infer an intelligent cause for something, some event or pattern that may actually have a natural cause. All right. So what's the what's sort of the quick and easy, obvious solution to that? Play it safe. Don't allow any inferences to intelligence until all natural causes have been tried. So in my little cartoon here, uh, we put this up on the shelf, right? Take natural causes and set them to one side. And we say, let's exhaust all the natural possibilities before we appeal to intelligence, because we don't want to make one of these mistakes. We don't want to short change or, or foreclose the search for natural causes. One might be out there. So to, to avoid error and you know tripping on the problem of induction, we'll put natural, we'll put intelligent causes, excuse me, on the shelf and restrict ourselves to natural causes. You can't do it. It's a logical impossibility, which is really the best kind of impossibility to have. Logical impossibility beats physical impossibility every time. Because logical impossibility, 
logical impossibility obtains in any imaginable universe. Okay, why is it impossible? Because you can't search the space. It's infinite in extent. Try A, doesn't work. All right, keep going. Try B, that doesn't work. Keep going. You cannot search that space because it extends indefinitely in all directions. We are finite creatures. We can only hold finite samples of experience. Eight billion human beings, which I guess we've just passed on this planet. We've hit the eight billion mark. Eight billion human beings are eight billion finite beings. They cannot search an infinite space. It can't be done. Because N plus one causes always remain to be tried. All right. This point is so important. I'm going to do it again on, a, on another slide. Here it is. The space of all possible natural causes cannot be searched because N plus one causes always remain to be tried. It's a logical impossibility, the very best kind to have. Don't try it at home. All right. So you think about this and you say, but Paul, we do infer intelligent causes. And you know what? I agree with you. Last time, part one, I showed this photograph that is a uh, uh, caused someone to be fired from his job as an LA Times photographer because this is not a real image. It was faked. And the fake was detected by a small probability specification down here. Talked about that last time. I talked about this experiment, uh, or excuse me, the, the, the two experiments here where the curves are identical. Again, you have a small probability specification. And the Publications of this scientist had to be withdrawn. There's pi, uh, the fir first part of the decimal expansion of pi, which we know to be caused as a mathematical object only by minds. There's Robert Clark Ridge being arrested in California. On and on and on. We do reliably infer intelligent causes. You do so, my listener, my viewer, on a daily basis. And you don't give it any, you don't worry about it, right? Overwhelmingly, these inferences are reliable, trustworthy. You don't do it by performing logical impossibilities. If this is the only thing you take away from this presentation, I will be happy. Namely, that you can trust your inferences to design and you can put weight on them. They're reliable. And what you have not done is searched an indefinitely large or infinitely large logical space. You have not eliminated all the possible natural causes. It can't be done. So the question is, well, how do you know that design is the true explanation? By some other pathway. Okay. And that's worthy of a whole PhD dissertation. We don't have time today, but I just want to assure you, you didn't do so biological impossibility. All right. So you say to me, well, Paul, we're sitting in a Starbucks having a conversation about this or some nice restaurant in London or in Karachi or who knows where. And you say, but why is it that most scientists hold to methodological naturalism? Because it appears that they do. Well, this may be a harsh thing to say, but I think it's intellectual laziness and inertia. They haven't really thought through why they hold this view. Okay. So here's my question. Why do they hold methodological naturalism? Well, I think we need to take some wisdom from the philosophy of science, in this instance, from Thomas Kuhn. All scientists work within paradigms, intellectual frameworks that set the boundaries for what they consider the legitimate problems to be solved, and the legitimate answers to those problems. And these are social communities, okay, where, you know, you're interacting with uh, colleagues and uh, a, a larger uh, sphere of interested people who will say, that's not a real problem. That is a real problem. That's not a real solution. That is a real solution. These boundaries are perfectly real. They may be hard to describe, but they're there. So Kuhn in his work talked about this with respect to so-called normal science. 
and the frameworks or the paradigms, to use his term, that scientists will accept. And we are in one such paradigm. I'm not, the science I know best is biology. And the framework for that science was set by the Darwinian revolution. David Hull, and I've mentioned this paper previously, uh, uh, was a historian and philosopher of science who was a student of the Darwinian revolution, understood it in great detail. And in this paper 40 years ago that I highly recommend to you, if you can track it down, he says the promotion of a particular view of science was as important, I would say personally more important to the Darwinian coterie in the mid to late 19th century as promoting a particular theory about the origin of species. And really the person to whom most of the responsibility for this, uh, to, to, the person to whom we should assign most of the responsibility for this is Thomas Huxley. Uh, Huxley founded the journal Nature. Still today, probably along with the journal Science, the most prestigious science journal currently published. He coined the term agnostic, which did not exist in English as a noun prior to Huxley, uh, having to do with the relation of science and theology. Huxley said, I'm an agnostic. Most importantly for our discussion today, he was instrumental in defining science or scientific explanation as applied naturalism or materialism. And he and like-minded, his like-minded colleagues and friends ran a program in England in the 19, late 19th century to change the nature of science itself. And they were successful at that. And we still inhabit that world today. Now, interesting, it's interesting to notice that even though Huxley called himself Darwin's bulldog, he was an ambivalent Darwinian. For instance, he never really put much credit on natural selection as a, as a cause. What he liked about evolution was its naturalism. And what he called the fundamental principles of a scientific conception of the universe. This comes from the history done by James Moore at the Open University. I believe he's still there in the UK. Uh, very uh, insightful historian of science who's looked at this episode. What does this phrase mean, the fundamental principles of a scientific conception of the universe? Well, we can look at that with respect to the history of science. So here we are in 2022 with the National Academy. The statements of science must invoke only natural things and processes. We can go back to the Darwinian revolution and Huxley uh, promoting this fundamental scientific conception of the universe. Now, we live in the world intellectually put in place by the Darwinian revolution. We're still there. Uh, over 160 years later, we're still there. But we can go back roughly symmetrically in the history of science to this guy, Isaac Newton. Newton, of course, thought that natural causes were real. You could see them, right? My pen that I'm holding that I let go in a gravitational field and down it goes towards the center of that field with a probability of one. But Newton thought that natural causes were insufficient to explain what we observe. So in a letter to Burnett, he said this wonderful phrase, where natural causes are at hand, God uses them as instruments in his work, but I do not think them sufficient alone for the creation. If we look at our timeline, it's very curious to note that the toolkit of science paradoxically is getting smaller as we come toward the present because what's been excluded or left out is what Newton thought was necessary, namely intelligence, mind that there were phenomena in the world that required a mind to explain them. So you can look at it this way. On the right, we have the green box or the green rectangle. That's all the phenomena that we wish to explain. On the left, we have the lavender box of causes. 
Now, let's suppose that we identify causes with natural causes, meaning where natural, again, means deriving from physics. Newton himself, excuse me, let me go back here. Newton himself would not have done this as that letter, as that passage I just showed you establishes, because he would not say that natural causes are exhausted by this. Where natural causes are at hand, he says God uses them, but I think them insufficient. Okay, if we locate over here in the phenomena an effect caused by intelligence, where intelligence means irreducible to physics, we are not going to find its corresponding cause in the box on the left because it's not there. Again, if we say that intelligence is in some important sense irreducible to physics, this is problematic. The toolkit of science has got small has gone grown smaller since Newton's time. Now, this is maybe the second most important slide in the presentation. Again, if you remember this and the other point that I made about not exhausting all natural causes, I will be happy. Let's let's say that it well let's define intelligence as irreducible to physics just for the sake of argument. And watch what happens now as physical knowledge grows. So we know more about the, the physical story. And design inference grows correspondingly because if intelligence is irreducible to physics, its explanatory power and uniqueness cannot be lost over time. It will always be an explanatory option in addition to what we know about the bottom-up story. Which tells you methodological naturalism is a very strange rule. What if intelligent causation were true? So I'm going to end with one final thought experiment, and then we'll have some time for discussion. So probably you've seen videos of this four-legged walking machine called Big Dog on YouTube. Boston Dynamics has a lot of videos on, on YouTube of their different robots. Uh, some of which are, frankly, a little terrifying. The, the robots have become so lifelike, it's a little spooky. But my brother Gabriel, my younger brother Gabriel, was one of the designers of Big Dog. He helped to write the code to enable it to walk. He's not at Boston Dynamics anymore. He was there for, I think, 17 years. But you can see him, if you go to YouTube and look up Big Dog, uh, the videos for Big Dog, search on Big Dog Boston Dynamics, you'll see Gabriel in some of those videos. And one, he's he's actually pushing a biped robot from the side. It's on a treadmill and he gives it a shove from the side and it kind of teeters a little bit and then recovers its gait. In any case, Gabriel worked on Big Dog, but this was not his first robot. This was when he was a PhD student. Now, this is a six-legged walking machine that Gabriel did, uh, he was involved in the project as part of his PhD at Case Western University in Cleveland. And uh, this is back, this is 22 years ago, when I was still reading paper journals. Now it's all PDFs downloaded, you know, from publishers' sites. But uh, at the time, PDFs still kind of coming online, not really a thing yet. And you can see the stickers here from the University of Chicago science library where I would go. Uh, I was a, a fellow at Discovery Institute at the time. I had, I had finished my PhD a few years earlier. I took this journal and ran straight to the copy machine and copied the cover because I knew this was Gabriel's robot. Now, he was working with a team of biologists who were trying to get a six-legged walking machine, and their research was funded by DARPA. Uh, and I think also by NASA, if I remember correctly, because both NASA and DARPA wanted walking machines that could negotiate rough terrain. And the, the team said, you know, why are we doing this from scratch? Why don't we reverse engineer a walking machine that we know can do that task and we'll figure out how that walking machine works and then we'll reverse engineer it and we'll develop our robot that way. So here is their natural model that they tried to reverse engineer, the ordinary cockroach. And it turns out 
Cockroaches are very hard to reverse engineer. So one of the things they did in their experimental work is they put these roaches on little treadmills, and you know, and there's no people for the ethical treatment of cockroaches that would rush in and stop them from doing this. Uh, in any case, they would change the speed of the treadmill and watch how the roach used its legs. And it turns out the gait, the locomotion of a rope of, of, of a cockroach is very sophisticated. They change how they use their legs depending on circumstances. So in the article, in that journal that I showed you a moment ago, Roy Ritzman, who's one of the biologists on the team, said, we have a long way to go to get robots that walk as efficiently as an insect. Well, that suggests a comparison. And this will be our concluding thought experiment. So on the left, we have Gabriel's six-legged robot, robot roach, let's call it. On the right, we have so-called ordinary cockroaches. Now look at what happens when we compare them. All right, Gabriel's robot had a lot of problems. So he would be the first to acknowledge. For instance, uh, one day, uh, Scientific American had a television program called Scientific American Frontiers, hosted by Alan Alda, the actor. And they wanted to film the robot walking. And the day that the film crew was coming to the lab, they could not get the robot to walk. All right, it had, a, it had problems. It broke down frequently. Not a problem over here. All right, that's why you have to go to the hardware store and buy the insecticide because you don't want roaches running around your kitchen or in your bedroom. All right, rarely breaks down. They're very successful little critters. Can walk only with help. Uh, it has to be supplied power either by an onboard power unit, as Big Dog had an onboard engine that, that generated the power to run the hydraulics and so forth, or draw electricity to run the uh, to run its motors and so forth from the lab. In any case, it doesn't operate on its own. Walks and runs unassisted. It doesn't feed itself. It has to be supplied power by the investigators, by the lab team. If you want roaches, leave out pizza or any food. Leave it out overnight in your kitchen. They'll be happy to help you with it. Okay, they, these are autonomous, very, as I said, very successful little creatures. Now, suppose Gabriel's task for his dissertation was to build, design and build a robot that built little robots. In other words, that somewhere on that big walking machine was a little chamber where the baby robots were going to be manufactured. He would never finish. He'd still be there. He'd still be working on his PhD. Not a problem. Okay. If, if instead of me talking to you, we watched a video of my brother's robot, the one at Case Western, the question that would naturally occur to you, entirely independent of your philosophical background, Muslim, Buddhist, Christian, Jewish, agnostic, it wouldn't matter what your philosophical or theological background was. The question that would naturally occur to you is who built that? No matter how imperfect it was, you would say the only rational inference for the robot on the left or for the cockroach, robot cockroach, is who built that? Who designed it? And you would not accept any other explanation. You would, in fact, you, you would regard any other explanation as profoundly irrational. You'd say, no, I'm sorry, Paul. You did not put the parts for that machine in a box and supply it with energy for 50 years and the robot stepped out. Someone did that. Now, what does modern... Neo-Darwinian biology tell us about the roach on the right. Okay, every time I think about this thought experiment, I say there's something wrong with this picture and it has nothing to do with the evidence and everything to do with what we're going to let that evidence tell us. That's a problem because if you have a philosophy of science that is standing between you and nature herself, and you're ending up saying, of course not, there's a problem, all right? And this rule is not a good rule for science 
because it tailors the evidence before the evidence has a chance to speak for itself. It is an opaque screen between you and nature. And I beg you as my viewer or listener, think very carefully before you adopt this rule because it will damage your ability to see nature as she is. The reason you will be stuck in here. Imagine that we're looking at a city top down, a circular city top down. We're viewing it from 30,000 feet in the air. And there's a very high and impassable wall here around this part of the city. You are restricted. Your freedom within that wall is restricted. And what might possibly be the case empirically true about the universe is out here. So you're, I would have this opinion even if I wasn't a theist. Okay, let's set aside my own personal philosophy, my own personal theology. Put that entirely to one side. Change me into an agnostic. Or frankly, change me into an atheist, right? It's not that hard for me to imagine. I interact with atheists all the time. Even if I had that view, I would not want methodological naturalism restricting my freedom. And something remarkable that I did not have time to put into this talk is there are many atheists, or as they prefer to call themselves naturalists, like Sean Carroll, who was at Caltech, he's now moving to Johns Hopkins. Sean Carroll, in his writings, does not like methodological naturalism. He says it's, it's in a sense, committing, a, it, it, it's short, short changing the enterprise of science. He says, we want science to be able to pursue the truth wherever it may lie, and methodological naturalism prevents us from doing that. Now, Sean Carroll is himself a philosophical naturalist, uh, uh, but he does not like this rule. Sahotra Sarkar at the University of Texas at Austin, who was in graduate school with me, same story, does not like the rule, and, and Sahotra is an atheist. Uh, may, he may be an agnostic. I don't want to misidentify him. Uh, uh, Jason, I think it, I think, yeah, I'm stuck on his name. There's a mathematician who's written quite a bit on intelligent design. Jason Rosenhaus, I think is his name. Um, and I apologize if that, if I've, if I've misidentified him, same story. There are plenty of agnostics and atheists who don't like methodological naturalism because of what it does to the freedom of science. So you don't have to be a crazy theist like me to have this opinion. Science should be free to discover what's out there. And that's, that's the intellectual world that I hope we can inhabit. All right. I actually finished five minutes ahead of time, which uh, is good. So we have uh, plenty of time now for discussion. Excellent. Thank you for a brilliant presentation again, Paul. As always, the explanatory filter is eye-watering, right? <laughs> um, what, what I find interesting about this is the may, maybe if you can go back to the filter. Sure. So, um, Let me just sorry, uh, let's, let's call that up very quickly. <clears throat> oh, I have to share my screen. Yeah. Um, but I'm but um apologize for this. It'll take just a second here. Oh. Uh, yeah. Okay, can you see it? Just give me a second. I can now, yes. So about this explanatory filter, um, what's interesting is the examples that you gave to show that, you know, someone jumped the gun and skipped some of the nodes and went straight down. Right. Those are the, not the exact same examples, but similar examples are basically used to make a straw man of the intelligent design. Yes. <laughs> Yes. And so I really loved the way that you broke it down. It, it, it's it's very difficult for an atheist to come back because I could almost see their, you know, their, their entire argument just physically cringe, uh, cracking because essentially 
those are the best arguments that they have, at least in their mind, which is, well, we have snowflakes. They look designed, they look complex. Um, could you just summarize this again? Because I think, although you mentioned um, about the point of, uh, what was the point? Um, the logical impossibility is better than having a, a physical impossibility. Right. That, that right. being the upshot of the presentation. I thought the upshot was this filter. Yes, well, the, the filter is... Uh, Dembski's attempt to uh, derive a model that that will handle all examples of design inferences that we know. Uh, so uh, intellectual property law, um, uh, criminal investigation, any any aspect of human inquiry where you work your way through a series of logical decisions, and you come to the end of that logic tree and you say the best explanation for the event or pattern in question is a mind or an intelligence. So we, there are you know, many areas of human existence, both in everyday life, in practical investigation or practical reason, in special sciences like archaeology or SETI and so forth. So this is an attempt to do that. And what Dembski argues, and I think he's right about this, is ordinarily what we do is we ask at these first nodes, is there some cause, some physical process, uh, principle, um, uh, something that we've identified out there in the world that will that is sufficient for the effect in question? So in the case of a snowflake, uh, what happens is the 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 crystallization of water under the conditions where snowflakes are produced will produce snowflakes. And the specification is lacking in that case. They're complex, right? So you're at this node right here, but you lack a specification that's independent of the complexity. That's what you have in the case of uh, the the faked photograph, the one representation of, of an Iraqi civilian specifies the second, but that's not his twin. That's him reproduced twice. So in that, in those cases, and I think if you look at all the cases I've given, both in this presentation and in the previous presentation, what you have that lets you get down here to design is what I call an analytical pincer. So that's yet a third metaphor. It's really, <laughs> you really know you're mixing metaphors and you've got three different metaphors operating. So I'm going to use the pincer one. You have two arms closing. Small probability, which maps into complexity. And again, I don't want to, there's not time. And uh, I we should really let Bill Dembski do this, but there's a whole mathematical framework for this. You've got small probability or complexity of a sufficient threshold and specification as two arms of a pincer that close. And I think if the viewer th thinks about his or her own design inferences, where they're looking at some pattern and they say that had an intelligent cause, they will see that complexity and specification are operating together. So let me give you a real another real life example. I love real life examples. In March 2009, I went to attend a talk by a friend of mine at the University of Chicago. A historian of science was giving a talk. I drove my Honda Odyssey, which is a minivan that I had at the time, down to the campus in Hyde Park, parked it on a street on the edge of campus, went in to hear the talk, came back out, and the passenger side front window was broken. Glass everywhere, glass on the interior of the car, glass on the sidewalk, and so forth. I look inside, I stick my head through the broken window, which is entirely gone. What's there? What's still there in the car? The McDonald's bag, the tattered road atlas of Chicago, uh, a bunch of my hockey gear, uh, you know, my daughter's school books that they forgot. What's not there? What's missing that was there when I drove down to Hyde Park? What's missing is my expensive Garmin 
a GPS unit. The Garmin is missing, the cord that you plug in, the leather case. Only the valuable objects have been taken. All right. Now, everybody listening to me from that pattern is going to make a design inference because yeah. you've got a complex pattern that's specified. Specified by what? Only the valuable objects are gone. And I'm sorry, Subor, I just have completely lost patience with people who, de who deny the rationality of this. Because you know why? It's not how they live their own lives. Yeah. Right? They're not going to sit down on the curb there in the March cold and start running through all the possible natural causes that can get only the valuable objects out of a car with a broken window. Yeah. So I'm sorry for getting exercise, but practical reason is real. And we do something like this, irrespective, as a point I've made multiple times now in both parts of this presentation, irrespective of our worldviews. This is, I would say that something like the explanatory filter is built into us. Yeah. Sorry, I got a little, I got a little pot under I mean, the I mean, this is something I'm very passionate about as well in Paul and Wad basically say is that design is not reducible to physics so it doesn't matter if they say look if we had a bit more time and you know that that goes on forever ad infinitum as you mentioned it's not the same thing there is nothing causally you can explain that the expensive item is missing and everything else is still there so it's so important um, that when these arguments are made uh, could you just go a bit more forward where you were talking about the timeline um, just oh yeah, let me uh, uh, let me just go because uh, that's what a brilliant point you were making about um, causally sufficient natural causes. This one, yes. So the fact is that when it comes to every area of human knowledge, it comes to sociology, it comes to philosophy, it comes to um, art human beings have made progress and they've developed new forms. So what we find is that, you know, within history, you'll have sub branches within philosophy, you have uh, greater uh, niches. But what we find is that we are being put in this straitjacket and we've actually regressed, we've devolved when it comes to having the ability to, in, to infer design, not just infer natural causes. And as you mentioned, Newton, you know, he didn't see that these were mutually exclusive. So it's sad that in the 1700s, we had things within our toolkit, which today would not be recognized. You know, I agree with you. And I want to add this nuance. Uh, in conversations with, with skeptical or atheist friends, they, they will say, but well, well, of course, Paul, if, if we detected pi on a narrow band radio, transmission coming in we could identify that as coming from andromeda or alpha centauri i would infer design i would infer design and they list a bunch of circumstances under which they would appeal to intelligence where they will not and i did not have time to include this today where they will not infer design is for anything that might implicate a transcendent cause yeah so biology or human human moral categories why do we have a sense of right and wrong that appears not to exist in any other species on this planet yeah right why do we have something that we would call a conscience and so forth mm -hmm. and the reason for that is not hard to find when design implicates a transcendent cause suddenly science looks to be entangled with things like theology yeah and uh the problem i have at that moment in that conversation is I say, you need to recognize that the logic itself has not changed. The patterns of evidence themselves have not changed. What has changed, and the reason now you're resisting design, is the implications go beyond science. And I would encourage all of us, atheists, agnostics, theists of all stripes, to be honest about this. And say, you know what, we need to recognize that there's more that we bring to this question that makes it enormously complicated and painful, frankly. And the more we can be honest with, e with each other about these barriers that we suddenly put up, 
and say, now I can't allow design because it implicates something that I would rather not think about. Um, I think honesty of that form is healthy. Uh, and my my what I say to students is be greedy. <laughs> be greedy for the best and richest toolkit you can have and trust nature herself, if I may personify her, that she's going to give you clues. Um, so anyway, I'll just yeah. I'll just ramble uncontrollably if you don't <laughs> stop me. So okay, no, no, that's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, just the last question to you about um, going back to the cockroach example that you gave, which I thought was brilliant. Um, I'll put this one up. Yeah, that's the one. So just on this point, um, and I think this is a good point to end upon. Um, when we find when we find ourselves in discussions with the other side and we are trying to make an argument and we get in reply, well, how can you say the human being is designed when we don't have bulletproof skin, when we have, you know, um, we age, you know, we have a very short lifespan and uh, so on and so forth and babies die. And we don't, like you pointed out, we don't point out that, well, in a human-made artifact, there is um, a lot more deficiencies than there is in the natural artifacts. So this asymmetrical inference that we find is due to their ideological beliefs about what a designer would do. But that would mean that they have some conception of what God should have done. So this is essentially a God complex. Right. I have actually heard atheists say, and I'm sure you have because you've been dealing with them for decades. Well, if I was God, well, <laughs> where are we, where are we going to go? Where are we going to go with that kind of, um, you know, it's, a, it's to me, it's one of the most interesting aspects of this whole uh, field, because if you look at uh, historically going back actually to the ancient skeptics, Democritus, Epicurus, and so forth, uh, and then come forward through the lineages that exist right up to, to until today, complaints about what God should have done are, are everywhere, right? In fact, Job, some biblical scholars say the book of Job is one of the oldest books in the, uh, in the Bible, right? What's the theme of Job? The theme of Job is I am suffering. Yeah. This, wor this world is broken. Yeah. And you you go to different world religions, Buddhism. What lies at the core of Buddhism? The Buddha is he's he's he is suffering and he wishes to be relieved of his suffering, right? So we all of us on this planet have a sense that it's not what it should have been. Yeah. Now, what are you going to do with that sense? Well, for Darwin, he said, I cannot love and I will not worship. I mean, I'm obviously he didn't say this. I'm paraphrasing. I cannot love and I will not worship a God who made this world directly. It is mm -hmm. filled with too many imperfections. And Subor, I want to give all the weight and, and dignity I can to that complaint, to that, to that sense of, of being out of place in this universe, right? Because it's so deep and it, it seems to be universal. The, the, the question is, is that a scientific thing or is that something that belongs to theology and philosophy? No. Um, so I, I do not diminish the problem of evil. I think it's the, the single greatest problem for any theist of whether it's within Islam or Christianity or Judaism or really any world religion has to deal with that. And my, my, encouragement to the to the viewer is recognize that if that if that troubles you that yes it's it is troubling but is it properly a scientific question that's the point that's the point brilliant thank you so much paul we've ended on time today um thank you for everybody that's been watching a lot of people um have been actually asking questions so what i'm going to try and do for next time is prepare by looking at some of the comments and then trying to choose which ones are going to be the most relevant. So thank you again, Paul, for that stunning presentation. Cheers. Great. I'll
I'm always glad to be here.